We're all set? Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Leif Bloomquist. Uh, I know most of you. I'm also on uh, IC Rob. And uh, I go on uh, by schema on IRC, so I might have chatted with uh, some of you there. So since uh, last year, there's uh, three uh, interesting projects I've been working on that I'd like to share with you. One is uh, a fairly quick hack, but it's uh, gathered a lot of interest, which is my little Wi-Fi adapter for the Commodore 64, so you can connect your 64 to Wi-Fi. Uh, the second is some ideas for a, a new Commodore 64 network game. And the uh, third one, uh, which I'll do at 4.30, is uh, my little motion sensing glove, so you can play games Nintendo Power Glove style on the 64. And that'll be at uh, 4.30. Okay, let's launch into the first one, which is my Wi-Fi adapter. So I based it on uh, something called the RNXV. Some of you who also dabble in Arduinos and so on may be with the XB modem, which is wireless uh, serial. So it gives you wireless RS-232. So a company called Roving Networks has designed this thing called the RNXV, which is a drop-in pin compatible replacement for the XB, except giving you serial, except instead of serial, it's Wi-Fi. So the, uh, the Arduino folks like to call this the Wi-Fi. And really what it does is it gives you a raw TCP connection to any uh, IP address, or you can also connect in to the RNXV and then it passes any incoming data through the UART. So it's actually fairly trivial to interface to the user port. It's uh, RX, TX, and ground and at 2400 baud, which is fortunate. The very lowest baud that the RNXV will do is 2400 baud. And the highest baud you can comfortably do with the classic terminal program on 64 is 2400 baud, so they meet in the middle, fortunately. But uh, I did run into a couple of interesting uh, issues with uh, hooking it up. Uh, the uh, RNXV runs off 3.3 volts, whereas it's all 5 volts both on the 64 and on the you know, Arduino for that matter. Fortunately, uh, Adafruit makes a board that uh, makes it very simple. You just plug in your XV or XB for that matter and put it onto, in this case, a little prototype board and it, uh, an interface to that. It takes care of all the level shifting. There is an alternate to this board made by SparkFun, which does not work. It's something to do with pull-up resistors and something that goes totally over my head. But this one works. This is... Uh, Something I didn't know about the 64 user port when you're using an RS-232 mode, there are two pins, marked receive data, B and C. You have to have them both connected. So I connected it to one, nothing. Tore my hair out for half an hour. Tried the other one, nothing. Little solder bridge between the two, worked perfectly. I, I don't know why. I'll need someone like Jim Bray to explain that to me. And the RNXV is also ASCII only, so you can call Commodore BBSs with them but you can only use them in ASCII mode, unless you don't do something really complicated by setting up the connection in ASCII and then quickly switching over to Petsky. The, uh, there is a development kit available for the RNXV, so you can write your own firmware, but the licensing fee is 2500 bucks. So that's uh, a little out of my range for a uh, evening hobby project. So I've just got the one slide on the uh, Wi-Fi. Any questions before I switch to a live demo? Great. So I'm just using the classic uh, snap term built into the super snapshot. So this is what sets this apart from something like the 64 NIC uh, Plus is that the 64 sees this as a modem or RS-232 device. So you don't have access to the TCP IP stack or the full packet. It's you know one byte in, one byte out. So if you remember the, ha the old Hayes modems where you would do plus 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 to go into a command mode and do your ATDT and so on, the RNXV does something so somewhat similar, it's it. except it's dollar dollar dollar, uh, puts you into command mode and it gives you a little command shell which is kind of fun to explore in and of itself. Like the RNXV is a little, this module is only about 40 bucks. <coughs> But it gives you a lot, uh, there's so much power here, you can set it up to automatically create the connection <coughs> the first time that it receives a byte on the UART, and there's hundreds and hundreds of configuration options. It even has a little <coughs> file system, so you can do LS, 
and there's the different uh, configuration files and firmware options inside the uh, the XV itself. But it is its primary job is as a Wi-Fi bridge, so you can do things like scan, scan for Wi-Fi networks in the area. <coughs> so I'm going to join the one called Heron Point. And if you're using like WPA2, etc., there's a there's commands for entering your password and, and everything. And there it goes. It's uh, connected to the hotel's Wi-Fi and it's doing DHCP. It gave me an IP address and it says it's listening on 14,000. So it can do interesting things and I'm gonna, I think I'm racing Glenn. Glenn, are you going to connect or, or Oh, you want me to? Well, you could. I still got it here. Okay, so open, the open connection. So Glenn's typing that from his phone. <laughs> so he's got a little Telnet application on his Android phone and is connected to that IP address, that port. And here we go, we have full two to, uh, bi-directional communication. Now, what can you do with all this? I have no idea. I'm just here to try it out and teach myself some electronics and play around and <coughs> yeah. exercise for the user to uh, do something interesting with it. Nmap, Netcat. <laughs> In theory. Okay. So because this and but because this gives you a raw TCP connection, it's not a true Telnet connection. You can't connect to things like a Freenet or a, a shell account. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's something you have to implement at the application layer, which might be a fun evening project. Okay, are you close now? I just, I just disconnected. Okay, I'll just connect with mine. Thinking about it. Oh, demo gods are uh, not on my side today. It was the same IP, was it, uh, Glenn? Uh, I'm sorry, I had uh, mm -hmm. 172.16.16.167. Yeah. Okay, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm actually more suspicious of my phone than of the next week. It's not an iPhone, is it? Little <laughs> <laughs> <That'll be> Android. <laughs> Okay, no, no joy with connecting this time, but you saw Glenn connecting and we were you know, sending some stuff back and forth, so that's pretty neat. Part of what I wanted to show off was using Swipe on my uh, phone, which is the most amazing keyboard ever. And so I can type on my 64 with a single thumb. Do you, you want to use my phone? Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Are you, do you swipe? Okay. Oh, are you, are you on, do you swipe for your keyboard? The swipe keyboard? Anyone use swipe on Android? Okay, okay so. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, no, the fastest to typing. Okay. Me oh, now it's open. <laughs> or is this you again? No. Oh, oh hold on, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, someone else. Uh, <laughs> someone's hacked my uh, 64. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. That's great. Very well done, whoever that was. Mm -hmm. Just move it over. Well, it was right there it's on the screen. screen. It was right there on the screen. Well, wasn't there some famous person who was just on uh, some talk show and they were showing off the Pebble watch and it showed their phone number on the watch uh, and, and the video and suddenly they got hammered, hammered, hammered mm -hmm. with, the 1500 with calls the marriage proposal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all I've got on the uh, on the Wi-Fi. But any questions? Any brainstorming on what we could use it for? 
So to put this something like this together is very simple. I've just got a prototyping board. I've got the RNXV itself, uh, the Adafruit level shifter board, and a, a 7403 chip, I think, to do the buffering, just to protect the user port. And that's it. Awesome. Great, thank you. And there's more. I'm doing three presentations all in one rapid uh, go here. <clears throat> Deep breath and welcome again to my next presentation. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Obviously, something that I, re I really enjoy tinkering around with is hooking up Commodore 64 to the internet to do interesting things, whether it's controlling it from your phone and so on. So, uh, a lot of my uh, hobby time is spent doing things like that, uh, including a couple of network games, some of which uh, you are familiar with. But uh, we've got some ideas for a new one, so I'm just going to run through those. <coughs> a little bit of history. So, it's 10 years now. For 10 years now, we've had various Ethernet and TCP IP options for the 64. It was always something that, that you know I personally thought would be really cool to have, and we've had them now for 10 years. So we have started with uh, Adam Dunkel's uh, final Ethernet, going through RNet, FBNet, 64 NIC Plus. Those all are based on the same chip, so any software you write for one will work for another, which is great. And there's some other unique solutions. There's the Comet, the Flyer, the ETH64, which is attached to the IDE64. Uh, there's been some experimentation with the Wiz 5100, and I just showed the RNXV, and lots of other one-off homebrews, <coughs> more uh, more fringe projects. But what do you do with all this? So there's lots of tools, which definitely have their place. So there's disk imaging, and there's file transfer, and you know, ways to call BBSs, do cross-development, which is really neat, chat, operating systems, and so on. But I always thought, what about games? Like, that's you know, part of the real draw of the 64. I mean, there were something like 23,000 games. So we have this ability now, let's make some games for our favorite gaming platform. So I've put together two. Uh, many of you have seen these. So back in 2006, I showed off Artillery Duel, just a little turn-based game, a little UDP packet goes back and forth each turn, and it's, uh, <coughs> it's your classic Artillery Duel. And it was a very minimal game world. There was nothing really to it other than here is here's the uh, direction and power of the shot. That's all the information carried back and forth between the two clients. Back in 2008, so I can't believe it's been that long already, uh, myself and a few others uh, put together NetRacer, which it took it a little farther. It was real-time multiplayer with eight players, and we had a central uh, server written in Java to manage all this. And the game world was much larger, uh, but it was still fairly static. <coughs> So, what next? It's been a few years since I've really gotten to some 64 network programming. So I want to do something a little more ambitious. Something, again, real time. And this time, massively multiplayer. You know, <laughs> I think every uh, player, potential player of this game is in the room right now. So that's a <laughs> massive would be. I want to have some server-controlled entities. I want to have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of AI controlling uh, things on the server. I'm looking at something with more complex gameplay, so you'd have multiple goals and encouraging teamwork, so people you wouldn't just get onto the game and just play by yourself. You'd have to coordinate with other people and work towards an active goal. And I want to have, here's this word again, massive and dynamic game world. So, Glenn, this uh, screen's for you. So how massive? How about 10,000 screens? So that's 100 screens by 100 screens. <coughs> so each screen, 40 by 25 character cells on the Commodore 64. So that's 10 million character cells or 640 million pixels. Just because we can. So here's some of the games that I've been drawing inspiration from for where I want this game to go. Uh, there's a game called Vortex. If, if some of you know it from Ahoy Magazine from a while back, a little type-in game, but it's really fun. You fly your spaceship around and uh, fend off the aliens and have to drill to the center of this little asteroid. There's a game called uh, Fort Apocalypse, which many of you know. Uh, again, you have to, uh, you're modifying the game world to get to <coughs> your goal. Zone Ranger, which is my personal favorite. Uh, I had it going with the, uh, the glove project uh, next door and again, 2D overhead space shoot 'em up. There's a game called Subspace, which I haven't actually played, but I've done a lot of reading and watching YouTube videos. Uh, so it's a PC-based game. 
overhead 2D space shooter multiplayer with a uh, malleable game world. So you're starting to see it the, uh, the thread here, I hope. And of course, last but not least, is Minecraft. I have a seven-year-old son, and he just lives and breathes Minecraft. And so I play it with him to you know, supervise. And again, mine, it's 3D, but it is a massive, malleable game world. So all of these are starting to filter together into an idea of what this next game could be. So I'm going to call it the, uh, I'd like to call it Vortex 2, as a spiritual sequel to the original game from Ahoy Magazine, because it has a little, little bit of backstory with the aliens invading the universe and all this. So there'll be a potential for some, a little bit of a story element. Uh, I want it to be a fast-paced overhead 2D space shoot 'em up so it'll feel like Zone Ranger when you're playing it. So you, you do standard uh, things, dogfight with alien ships, seek power-ups, and save the universe. Again, I want to encourage teamwork. So someone, so there, I want to set goals in the game that you actually need two or three people log, logged in simultaneously, one to fight off the aliens while one drills their way to a, uh, a power-up or a goal. But there's still lots of details to work out. This is the framework of what I've got. And there's lots of little things like, well, when you do this and this and this, and then this happens and you get rewarded in this way with this many points. Lots of detail to work out. But that's half the fun. But here's where we are with it. Uh, I've, I'm a software engineering manager at my day job, so I write design documents. <laughs> I've done a draft, and a few of you here have uh, had a browse through those. I do have a server set up. I've set up a VPS in Montreal with Ubuntu server. Uh, just to use as a development platform. I didn't want something in my own house so that it was easier to work on elements like getting through uh, routers and so on. Uh, there is a proof of concept server running. We have a proof of concept client working. It's not much to, to show yet. It's still Petsky graphics and fairly crude, but you can fly around and explore the, the universe a little bit. And uh, we've got a guy who I met through the Lemon forums who's put together some graphics the character set, just to get an idea of the feel of it. Technical design decisions. This is the part where I put everyone to sleep and I caught a yawn hey. over here. Uh -uh. <laughs> so this, because there's going to be so much going on and in theory we'll have tens of users, uh, we're going to have the server controlling the game logic. So if, you know, th if this bullet is in this character cell and this is colliding with this, to have the clients try and manage that will be crazy. So let's do that on the server. Uh, likewise, arbitrating collisions, actions, and so on. So when you perform an action on the, on the C64 client, it'll be the server that actuates that. So I'll be uh, doing something not unlike what we did with the NetRacer, where the screen and sprite location data will be streamed from the server to the client at nominally uh, 20 hertz. But then I want to get a little more ambitious. I want to have the sprite and character data streamed from the server to the client when the game starts up. So the game would just be a stub to go to the server and say, okay, give me all my sprite data. So you might have the, uh, the Google effect, if you will, where you play your game one day and suddenly it looks totally different. Because all that is stored on the server. It's a network game. You have to get into that mindset, even though it's a Commodore 64. So when the, the player inputs, you know, the joystick fire button, activating various power-ups, that'll be streamed again from the 64 back to the server. It'll collect that and have its, and arbitrate the game state. I'll be writing the server in uh, Java 7. <laughs> Using Eclipse. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> unless, unless the <laughs> Eclipse is what we use at work, so that's what I'm most used to. And uh, we'd be using CA65 and the IP65 library. I started experiment experimenting with it and found it was very <coughs> powerful, easy to use, and modular. In fact, the network can go is done as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> so, you, so you're targeting the uh, CS8900 devices? Yes. But what I've done in the code is I've got an abstraction layer. So in the game, when you need to do something, it calls a thing. And from there, it branches into the IP65 code. But it could easily branch to something else. And uh, IP65 is put together originally by Per Olufsen and then uh, John O'Downs. He already has support for like the Wiz 5100 and so on, stubbed in in the code. Really? So it's there. Yeah, the IP65 is really interesting. Like he's made a VIC-20 build of it, so you can have a TCP/IP stack on your VIC-20. Yeah. 
just because. But IP65 is what's working for right now, so that's what we're going for. But there is an abstraction layer in the code, so we could put in other things as needed. Some of the challenges, though, that I'm anticipating as this goes ahead is finding enough raster time. So talking to the CS8900 is you know, very expensive time-wise, so it takes most of a, ra of a screen in terms of the screen raster just to read the packet, and then another uh, you know, another screen's worth <coughs> to copy it into somewhere useful, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, leads into the next one. So how to handle the eight sprite limit on the 64? You can't do fancy sprite multiplexing tricks if all your raster time is being spent copying data around and reading from the network card. But there's a couple of ways we could do it. You've seen games on the 64 that as soon as the uh, screen gets really busy and starts flickering, that's because it's just, rather than multiplexing by screen raster, it's just showing on one frame it shows this, the next frame it shows it shows these eight sprites, the next screen it shows these eight sprites. But I'm also thinking of doing things like just show the eight sprites that are most immediate to the player. So some details to think about there. And something that'll actually be quite fun, but I don't have, you know, I don't have much detail of how to go about it, is generating 10,000 Commodore 64 screens will be a, a little bit tedious. So I want to use algorithm, algorithmic uh, generation to put together all the you know, little planetoids and asteroid belts and all that. So Robin, that's something where I'm going to be asking you about because you are an expert at that. And an idea we're kicking around is why not have multiple clients? Why just have a C64 client? Why not have Android and iOS clients? So you could have a guy on a 64 playing head-to-head -head with someone on an Android phone. And if we use the same sprites and character set for a consistent experience, I think it'll be really quite uh, neat. So the team so far, there's me. I've come up with all this nonsense on these PowerPoint slides. Uh, I wanted to put the networking, as far as I'm concerned, is already done. It's just a packet of here's what the player is doing, going out, and here are the sprites you need to display, and other information coming back from the server. So networking was actually easy. Again, thanks to the IP65 library. And uh, I'm looking at the server code. A guy named Saul Cross, who I met through Lemon Forms, is putting together the graphics. Bryce Wilson has uh, volunteered for uh, working on the client code. Robin gives us uh, tons of advice. And John O'Downs, who's uh, currently supporting IP65, has been really helpful. And we have a few play testers. Dan uh, Broken Briganti and Rob Adlers. And at the bottom, and you. This is, uh, I originally had an idea of just coding this massive game and showing up you know, here at World of Commodore and saying, here's this game. But that's not terribly community-minded. It's actually, it might be a little, I might have bit off more than I can chew. But uh, I'd love to uh, get people from the community to work on little parts of it in TBD. I'll volunteer sticks. Awesome. He's working stuff. Okay, so I, the game isn't very far along in terms of something that you can pull up and play. We do have the you know, conceptual stuff. We'll probably do some hacking on it tonight at 3 a.m. because everyone's here. And uh, see what we can uh, come up with. Again, a bunch of ideas, but uh, I think it'll be a, a fun little hobby project and push the, push the state of the art, if you will, of Commodore network gaming into the next generation. So that's what I have. Any questions? Wow, did I totally stun everybody? Is that going to show a demo? No, I don't. It's, yeah, not, it's, uh, not, it's not at a demoable state. Maybe okay. by tomorrow morning, <coughs> Bryce and I are going to hack around. Still very it. exciting. Great, thank you. I'm also doing another demo, but let's take five minutes before I, because uh, I have to switch some hardware around and so on. And this is 